The next thing you wanted to talk with me about and have us have a discussion is about leadership in rehabilitation medicine. And um, I, I hope to go through these um, fairly simply and then have us get a real discussion. Um, where, and and uh, Tom actually has his background as an industrial psychologist before he became a journalist, um, knows a bit of how people in team work. So, so this is not uh, a talk that I would give by myself, except for the, that I made the slides. <laughs> so let's see, uh, this has to go like this. So this is Howard Rusk. In 1966, they awarded this medal to Howard Rusk um, because he had led rehabilitation in the world from World War II. After the war, he formed the World Rehabilitation um, Fund, and they were in 110 countries. And if you go back and find a very, very old man in Cameroon, or a very, very old woman in Cameroon who was in rehabilitation, they were trained by Howard Rusk's people. That's how much influence he had, okay? Well, so he's the father of rehab medicine in the United States. He even advised the president of the United States on how to build Europe. He was just a great leader. That's where his power was. And he had powerful friends. So he convinced donors and supported laws and he funded programs all over the world. Okay. This is the backside of the Rusk Medal. Physician, teacher, author, inspiration to patients and disciplines. Prime mover of the development and spread of rehab throughout the world. Okay, well, so on his deathbed, Howard Rusk gave this very medal to Jim Swanson uh, in the Western part of the United States. And Jim was trained by Howard Rusk and was the father of rehab medicine in the Western states of the United States. In June of 2011, Jim Swenson was blind and he could hardly walk and he was very frail. And he handed this medal to me and said that we needed to carry on Rusk's work. He died a couple wow. years later and I'm left holding this very, very heavy, heavy, heavy weight. Hmm. And that means what? I'm gonna go live in Africa and practice medicine? No, no, it means I have to do what Howard Russ does. I have to lead, right? So this is the start of why we're doing this. This is Noel Titchy. at one point, my good friend Noel was rated as the number one or number two business consultant in the world. He's a professor at Michigan. General Electric is the world class company it is because of Noel Titchy. And he's changed whole school systems. The Sultan of Brunei uses him as his top consultant. He's one of the great leaders in the world. And maybe because I was lucky, uh, when I started out at Michigan, I took care of one of his family members and he saw how my rehab team was working so well. Because my rehab team was working so well, he asked me to join him. And for the last 20 years, I've helped Noel teach leadership to corporate executives from some of the biggest companies in America. Okay. So very much the way I teach leadership comes from my friend Noel. I was on the phone with him yesterday and he was excited that we were talking about this today. He is a great supporter of your work. He knows what you're doing there, okay? And we've talked about the teams in Africa for a long, long time. He's getting pretty old, but he's pretty cool. So these are Titchy-isms. Once I was with the Dean of my medical school and the Minister of Health of a foreign country and we were all having dinner and the dean said, what are you people talking about? And the minister said, oh, Andy and I are using titchy-isms. We're using titchy-isms, okay? Here are titchy-isms. As a leader, you have to have a teachable point of view. Leaders teach. They don't tell people what to do. They show people a way forward that's better than they thought of the way they thought of in the first place, okay? So leaders are teachers. And if you can't get the message across to people in a simple way, you're not a good leader. Create a political map. When you want to get something done, and, and Dr. Kambu, I'm afraid you're very, very talented at this. Uh, he's very talented at this. 
when you want to get something done, you have to look at all the people. You have to look at their official jobs. You have to look at their life challenges outside of the work you're trying to get done. And you have to look at their interpersonal relations. You have to look at their personal psychology. And you look at all the people around you as a leader and try to understand everything that moves them forward, okay? It's not as simple as being a straightforward, this makes money for our hospital or this is good for our patients. You need to walk in the shoes of the person you're working with or you won't succeed. When he has teams, and we do a lot of exercises with this, he uses the grippy. So we'll do an experiment and we'll have a team go do a project for the day. And then we'll come back and we'll say, okay, team, I want you to do a grippy. Well, wh what's a grippy? A grippy says, were we clear on the goals? Exactly, what are we supposed to do? Should we call the company president and clarify the goals? Do we really understand what she wants us to do? Okay. Roles. Do we understand why each of us is on this team? Do we understand the specific reasons why, like I'm an occupational therapist, and do we understand the other reasons why, like I'm an occupational therapist, but I also come from this village. And so I can give the team more than simply being a therapist. I understand where the patient came from. Okay. Really getting deep into the team's roles. Then there's P, which is processes. Okay. And it's interesting because we have done programs with the, the Navy SEALs, you know, the military expert group that got Osama bin Laden, right? We, we worked with them. Okay. We've worked with corporate executives and we've worked with volunteer organizations in the poor parts of the cities. And each problem has a different best process. And before you engage in team meetings, you stop and you go, what's the best process, okay? If there's a fire in your building, the best process is everybody shut up, I'm in charge, go that way, okay? If you know that there might be a fire in your building three months later, the best process is let's all think of things together. Let me think of your ideas. Let's come up with a consensus. Does anyone disagree? Why do you disagree? Okay. If there's gonna be a government, you have to have a vote, which is a compromise between people's ideas. And each project or process has to define how it's gonna go through things before you can succeed in getting the job done. And the I is interpersonal. How do we get along? You know, is Andy Haig a guy who talks too much and is stubborn? You know, is Tom Haig, ah, Tom Haig's always got ideas. He's always got an idea. Is um, uh, Roland, Roland, I don't know you Roland, is Roland a quiet guy who's quiet in the corner, whispering? and smarter than us because he finally comes up with a better idea than all of us talking people, right? Did we honor all of those interpersonal skills and strengths and weaknesses, right? So we have team meetings and we have grippies. We do grippies, okay? Building a leadership engine. Leaders train leaders, okay? If I'm leading a program, uh, the spine program at the University of Michigan, I train leaders, okay? So for example, at the University of Michigan, my secretary with a high school education, by the time I left, she had a degree in business and she was the director of all of the clinics for the 300 people in the rehab department, okay? My junior physiotherapist is now the head of physiotherapy for 50 physiotherapists. Everybody I work with became leaders. My residents are now the chairs of major departments around the country. Now I'm proud of all them in their new roles, but the real point of a leadership engine is if you look at every secretary and nurse's aide and cleaning person in your building and say, let's make them a better leader, they perform better. Okay, they perform better and the good ones stay and the bad ones leave, right? 
So building a leadership engine is how Noel makes great leaders. You as a leader are teaching other leaders. And then the other one is that succession planning starts on day one. I want to replace myself, okay? Tom and I are both working really hard every Wednesday night meeting with people about how to replace us. Now, I hope I'm not going anywhere and I hope I can continue to help and lead for another decade. But I will be so proud if some of the young doctors and nurses that are working with us in the young leaders group mm -hmm. take over and run this organization. And by the way, even if I stick around for a while, they are going to be empowered to lead this thing and do a better job than one person with his one vision, right? So these are titchy isms. These are the way that you build great leadership, okay? Let's go into rehab now. So I'm going to talk about global, national, academic, institutional, and team leadership, okay? Most of this is just fun information, but when we get towards the bottom, we're talking about you and your work. Another titchyism, it's actually a big, Noel uses it now, which is you're always playing with real bullets. You're always playing with real bullets. We don't go through talk and exercise. We look at the real world and your real leadership roles. So before we're done talking together, I hope that we talk about leadership in your team and start doing some real problem solving. So real bullets. We don't do little exercises in Andy Hagen. C'est-à-dire que vous, jou vous jouez avec un fusil active. Les balles sont vraies <laughs> dans le fusil. <laughs> okay. Mm. So here's the world infrastructure. The International Society of Physical and Rehab Medicine is the world leader in our field. You know, and it does all the things that you think. It is actually the official liaison to the World Health Organization. It has annual meetings. It has tens of thousands of members. And most countries in the world are members of the International Society. It's where things happen. Um, Kembu, uh, I, we've started this and I haven't gotten far with it yet. I'm going to try to put together the African Society to be a member organization. Um, I've talked with the leaders there, but, but the, you, need to be a part of the ISPRM and we're working on that, okay? Yeah. They've got okay. journals, they've got committees, they've got disaster rehab committee, they've got expansion of the field committees, et cetera. So this is the group that really is the powerful and good leader. Tom will tell you that 15 years ago, Tom and I jumped in and were part of what saved this really weak organization. It was really, really financially broken and really weak. Tom built their websites. He kept on trying to teach them how to make themselves solvent. And I started coming up with these committees. And then we both backed off because the organization is doing fine. Our group, I want you to think of us as a subservient troublemaker. Okay? We're not a global leader. We're a group of friends who try to help good things happen. We don't want to be a global leader. We want power to be in the ISPRM and the World Health Organization. There are all kinds of NGOs that are in leadership roles in the world, like the Red Cross, Red Crescent, um, Doctors Without Borders, um, things like that, right? Uh, we call Doctors Without Borders um, Doctors Without Rehab because when rehab <laughs> doctors have volunteered to help them, they make them pass out immunization. They don't know what to do with this, okay? There are allied health specific world leaders. The best one, I think Tom, you might agree is ISPO, the Ortho, uh, Osteo, uh, uh, Orthotics and Prosthetics Group. They are awesome. They really do go all over the world and try to help out. They've got a presence in Africa that's pretty good and they help in war zones. But then the like- The ophthalmologist as well. The opto, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, opto was great. In rehab, um, the International Physiotherapy Society is pretty good, but they kind of are political and they deal with American and European issues. And then they kind of say Africans should follow or, or, or Asian, you know, they're kind of not quite drilled in. Occupational therapy, speech therapy, kind of helping. Rehab nursing hasn't really taken that role yet as an organization. So within allied health professions, there's an opportunity, but, but not so great. And the other NGOs that are involved in rehab are charitable or religious organizations, okay? 
Now, these groups do great, great things, and, and they will continue to, and they are your ally. But you need to remember where they come from. The executive director of, um, I won't mention organization, that woman or that man built their career to get to that point. They got to that point not by having an African child say thank you, not by having an African doctor by say thank you. They got to that point by raising funds. And by the way, if they raise more funds, they get a better job with more pay at another place. These are good people. These are not bad people. But the politics and the political map of the charitable and religious organizations has to do with their own sustainability as well as their really good, important mission. And so this is why a lot of these have not promoted things that they hand off to somebody else, okay? They promoted, um, let's bring wheelchairs to Africa. They haven't promoted, let's teach Africans to build a wheelchair factory so they can make money, right? And of course, Africa's problems are Africa's problems. So when you're approached by these groups, they're now getting the message, okay? There's even a word for these, they're called venture philanthropists instead of venture capitalists. These organizations are now turning around and realizing that their donors are looking to build sustainable programs where you are leading and they're providing the catalyst. So there's an opportunity, but, but you have to understand where they get their power. In a country, you have national leadership. The role of, of national leadership in rehab is to advocate for, advocate for all of rehab, the physiotherapists, the nurses, et cetera, not just the doctors. You know, we need more rehab hospitals. We need a better community-based rehab network, right? Uh, we talked about this earlier, Tom and I, which is that there's a little problem in that um, the consumers are our bosses. We work for the people, they don't work for us. But the conflict of interest between people who are healthy with disability and our medical role in taking care of the people who don't have a voice is really important for medical leadership and rehab. As a medical leader, I respect the need for jobs, but as a medical leader, my role is to say, why isn't there a physiotherapist in the intensive care unit? Why don't we have spasticity drugs on our national formulary? Um, there are really stupid interdisciplinary turf battles, okay? Where the nurses think they're in charge, the physios think they're in charge, the doctors think they're in charge. And these happen in all countries and they're often powered by people who, who want leadership roles. And they're often the fuel, the flames of this fire are often fueled by international organizations who are looking for their own political egos, okay? I've seen it in Africa where uh, an American physiotherapy leader came and told my African physios what they should do because it works in American politics. And my African physio friends were just going, this doesn't make sense, okay? <laughs> so as leaders in your country, you wanna to work together, not listen to the noise and realize that you all have the same mission. It's really hard to do because everybody's leadership role means more money, more prestige, and you just want to not go there. Physicians in rehab have an interesting longitudinal viewpoint and unfortunately more political credibility than some of our other friends. I say unfortunately because there are better leaders in social work and, rehab, and ther physical therapy. But you recognize that you need to use the physician's leadership in rehab because we've got this viewpoint from the intensive care unit until they've been home for six years and haven't seen a therapist for a decade or whatever, right? Most countries have a society in the US and these are organizations to pay attention to because their websites have a lot of resources and because at some point, some of these may be helpful to you. So the American Academy of Physical Medicine Rehab is for clinicians. There must be 10,000 or 8,000 members of the American Academy. Um, it doesn't do much global health work, but it's very important to help with us. The Association of Academic Physiatrists is technically an American organization, but it is really working hard to expand and reach out to academic rehab doctors around the world. And they just named me onto their global health committee so that I'm there to help represent you and to bring you into the fold in academic rehab medicine, okay? So the AAP looks American, 
Uh, all the residency training programs, the academic programs, our members, the AAP, but it's going to help us out. It's going to be a friend to, 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 to Cameroon. The American Congress of Rehab Medicine is really cool. And if you went to just one meeting in the US, and it's not a meeting I go to <laughs> because I go too many, it's the ACRM because this is interdisciplinary. Sometimes the president is a physiotherapist or a medical doctor or a speech pathologist or an administrator. And this is interdisciplinary, which is the way it should be. For all kinds of sad reasons, uh, about 15 years ago, the American Congress had corrupt leadership and they were separated from the academy. So now the medical doctors meet in one place, the Congress meets in another place. Medical doctors go to that meeting, but that's not the main meeting for medical doctors. And the Congress is a really awesome group of all the leaders across disciplines. So that's a, a great group to hang out with, especially if you're in an allied health, but even for us physicians, I wish we had more of it. Um, so we've informally formed this African society and uh, <laughs> Symphoria, you and Ethiopia, uh, you, God, you, you and Cameroon have a, have a society formed already and I'm talking to them. So I, I'll leave it to you what you call yourselves, but you are it and give yourself a name, give yourself a letterhead and a, and a, and a logo <laughs> and all of a sudden you look legitimate. Eh? It's, nothing, it's fraudulent, but it's nothing more than give yourself a name and a letterhead and all of a sudden you can write letters to people. Eh? Yes. Academic leadership. Gosh. Yeah. So in medicine, in rehab medicine, these are the roles that people will take in your country as you build programs. Traditional academics, of course, the research. Do you know how powerful it is when a little paper is published in a journal from Cameroon? People pay attention, okay? People in Cameroon pay attention. People in Africa pay attention because there's so little research on rehab that they attack it. And when you publish a paper, it has so much political power, you can't believe it. So over time, the academic role of you folks publishing some papers, of us helping you or teaching you how or mentoring you or finding the German doctor or the German physio who knows more about electrical stimulation, whatever you have a passion for in research is more powerful than you ever think. Teaching of medical students so that from the day of injury, that family doctor says, what about work? How are you gonna get back to work? Residency training programs. So we have doctors learning how to do our specialty and subspecialty training. You know, in the United States and in many developed countries, after you've finished your four year rehab training, you can go on and become a pain medicine subspecialist, a neuromuscular and electromyography specialist, a brain injury specialist, a spinal cord injury specialist, or a pediatric specialist and be board certified in a subspecialty, okay? So many, many of the academic centers are going beyond general rehab medicine to subspecialty training. Some of our friends, by the way, Tom, I think you know this, but our friends in Milwaukee are opening the doors to our African friends coming and getting some subspecialty training in some of those areas, which will be really fun when we can get uh, 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 Symphorian over to, to, to Wisconsin. Well, sports medicine in Ethiopia. Sports medicine, yeah. Um, uh, a palliative care, another one. Um, clinical uh -huh. services, the academic centers usually run the multidisciplinary specialized program, whether it's the inpatient rehab hospital with 200 beds, which by the way, Cameroon needs that inpatient rehab hospital with 200 beds. That won't be enough beds, but you get the idea of the scope of this. Or whether it's the single visit outpatient assessment so people can come from 300 kilometers away with their multiple sclerosis, come one day, <laughs> see a neurologist, a physiatrist, a PT, an OT, a nurse, a social worker, and a psychologist, and go home to their local community and their community-based program, right? These are typically run out of academic centers. Um, and the academic centers in most countries become the hubs when you have a hub and spokes system. Um, the clinical services of an academic center often are motivated to outreach to the medical community, to, to do community education for the physicians and nurses and therapists in the community. And because all of a sudden Tom Haig is called a professor, then the uh, governor, we will call you Professor Tom, congratulations. Um, then the governor of Oregon calls up Tom Haig and says, you're the professor of rehab medicine 
you tell me what our policy should be, right? So by being called professor, you all of a sudden are a policymaker. So these are the academic leadership roles in rehab medicine. Now you have a hospital. And it's interesting. Why did I separate institutional leadership from rehab team leadership? Because if you take a good look at the rehab leader in the context of a general hospital or a big hospital system, there are really important leadership roles, okay? You are part of the survival of a general hospital, okay? The hospital is doing brain surgery and delivering babies and doing HIV stuff. You're part of that business and you have to help that hospital succeed with its business. The second institutional leadership you have to do is take a broader view of the business of providing the best. And that means the work of rehab in supporting orthopedics, in supporting oncology, in supporting neurology, where does my rehab team insert itself to make our hospital generally a better hospital? Is it by having a consultant? Is it by teaching? Is it by developing a protocol, right? Rehab decreases hospital length of stay if it's done right. And so for your hospital leadership to realize that you can shorten length of stay and save money, well, you're helping the hospital even if it's not helping your rehab unit. Rehab's been shown to improve clinical outcomes. And if your government hospital needs to report how it's helped, you are the expert on outcomes as a rehab team and you improve outcomes because people walk after their abdominal surgery. They, they do better things, okay? And the other interesting part of the business of a hospital is you make other clinicians more efficient. For example, at the University of Michigan, our orthopedic spine surgeons would typically see 20 patients before they get one operation. We said, nobody sees back pain patients in surgery. They all see a rehab doctor and they get handed to the on a platter with all the indications, the patient understands, all the imaging is done. So that our chief of surgery, one out of every two patients he saw in clinic was in the operating room the next week. Now, he was a very expensive doctor and a real expert resource that we needed. And instead of him seeing 20 people before he could use his skills, he saw two. Okay? So this is where we make other clinicians more efficient. And then the other thing that's really interesting, if you ever visit an American rehab unit, these are the happiest places in the hospital. Because we take people who are in horrible shape and they get better. They may not get cured, but they get better. So when the person in the, when the nurse in the intensive care unit is looking at a vegetative comatose brain injured patient, then the rehab therapists are happy because they sat up or they walked or they said a word, that happiness, that culture of success going back to the acute care hospital makes the whole hospital work better. And so you want to consciously foster happiness and hope in your team, which is not hard to do because your team does wonderful things. And you want to infect the rest of the hospital with their successes. Thank you, thank you um, stroke unit nurses. I know the patient crapped all over you and vomited on you. But look, she's home with her family now. They need to see the other half of that. And that's where you are really strong institutional leader. Okay, this is the best part. This is us. This is you. This is real bullets. Yes, of course. Teams. Let's think about teams. Anybody play football in Cameroon? Anybody play football? Yes. We all play football. Yeah, all we right. We all play football. Yeah, right. Now we have a competition in the... <laughs> <laughs> we have a competition good going I understand. on now. So you have a five-year-old playing football. You see a bunch of five-year-olds playing football. They each try to kick the ball into the goal. Everybody says, my job is to kick the ball into the goal, right? That is called a multidisciplinary team. That is the physiotherapist on the first floor of the building, the nurse on the third floor, and the doctor in the outpatient clinic. 
That is five-year-olds playing football. Is that good football? Yeah. yeah. Now you get some 10-year-old Cameroonians or some 18-year-old Americans because we're pretty stupid about football. Eh? And what do you have? You have the people in the front. You got the defensive players. You got the midfield players, right? And they know their jobs. They know their roles. They do them well, okay? That's pretty good. That's like a rehab team that all kind of meets and says, oh, physiotherapy, you're doing this? Very good, thank you very much. I'll take what you did, increase range of motion to the knee, and as a nurse, I will now use that to help him to transfer out of bed on his own. Yeah? Uh, you hand to me, I hand to you, we collaborate. Mm -hmm. But that is just a 12-year-old Cameroonian playing football. He knows the basic rules, or she knows the basic rules, right? Um, the Ghana Black Stars, they don't play like that, right? The American team still does. When you've got a world-class football team, then let's say one of the midfielders, um, they sprained their right ankle. They shoot right. Well, everybody compensation shifts. They know that person's job. They know their strengths and weaknesses in the job, and they compensate. Okay? They also innovate. So somebody from the backfield gets the ball and they see an opening and they start driving all the way down the freaking field and everybody else says, oh, I know it's my job to score because I'm up front, but frankly, he's got a shot at this. I'm backing off. They know how to compensate for each other's strengths and weaknesses and they know how to innovate and they are free to innovate. Nobody's going to yell at them for getting out of the way and letting the person score. That is what's called transdisciplinary teamwork. Okay, and your goal with a rehab team is to have transdisciplinary teamwork. And it doesn't happen in a team meeting. It occurs over the course of months and years where you consciously build that transdisciplinary teamwork. So team meetings, any competent rehab team has team meetings once a week on all the patients, maybe once every two weeks. And it's actually mandated in Europe and in the United States and in most of Asia you don't get paid to have a rehab unit unless you have team meetings. Okay? And these bridge the gaps between the professions. They bridge the gaps. I'm going to talk about how to do this in this area. They recognize and improve the individual's skills in communicating to each other and, and within their field. I sure wish physiotherapy knew how to use a TENS unit. Let's go find a way to get more training on a TENS unit. Huh? And these team meetings ensure that the meetings are efficient. You don't have a lot of time and that they're effective because you have quality assurance that says you got the job done. Not because you had a fun meeting, but because six months later, the patient's family is still using that walker. They haven't thrown it away. You chose the right walker, right? So continuous quality improvement. So, and, and finally, as we talked about earlier, the team values what do we value as a team? What are our inside jokes as friends? Team morale, sometimes it's really hard to be on a team. And as leaders of teams, you need to make sure your team is happy. And sometimes you even have patients that make people unsafe and people leave them physically and emotionally safe on the team. So just as a closing picture of a rehab team functioning well, this is an experiment that I did with teams to teach them how to become transdisciplinary. So Tom and I grew up in the city of Milwaukee, which is very famous for beer, okay? Milwaukee, um, Miller beer is from Milwaukee, okay? So one week, I took an empty beer bottle to the team meeting, and I put it on the table in the middle, and I spun it, and I said, Whoever the bottle points at gives a physiotherapy report. The bottle pointed at the psychologist. I said, give the physiotherapy report. The psychologist said, I don't, I'm not a physiotherapist. I said, give the report. The psychologist said, well, honestly, I think she's walking a little better, but I don't know if I'd let her, like she wasn't very safe getting into the chair in my office. Thank you. We went and spun the bottle with everybody. When we're all done, I went to the physiotherapist and I said, what did the psychologist miss? Nothing. 
well, don't come to the meeting next time because we don't need you. <laughs> it's a joke. But the point is that we have people walk in each other's shoes so that they can understand what the person's role is. We have them understand what's really essential, okay? If the occupational therapist comes to the team and says, range of motion of the elbow went from 35 to 45 degrees, I say, who cares? If they can't tell me who cares, then they should not mention that. Now, if they say, therefore, he can wipe himself in the bathroom, oh, tell the nurse that, right? And of course, I'm never so rude. And of course, I'm never so blunt. They learn each other's jobs, and they learn what they need to hear from them. They develop a transdisciplinary football team that can win the Africa Cup, okay? So, um, bottom line, last picture. Being a medical doctor does not make one a leader. And you will find that people on the team are stronger leaders. You use them as your leaders.